which uh, translates to your emotional information. And the cortex usually controls the amygdala or the, or the feelings. And sometimes you can flip your lid. And your um, upper cortical functions are no longer communicating with the rest of your brain. And you to close the thing right now. But I'll share those. Um, I'll share the link because he demonstrates it in a really beautiful way because it's his concept. So I talked about how the first thing sometimes I talk about with kids is the physical sensation, because that's really something that most kids can relate to um, when you talk about how they feel. Um, it's tangible, I can say. I can see you're frowning. I can see that you look like you're about to cry. I can see that you have a very disciplined look at your face. I can see that you're you know, jumpy. I can see what's going on with you. You can see it. Um, and sometimes, um, so I work from the outside in. Um, it's just a little easier with kids who are very dysregulated. And um, so I'll say, this is actually a, uh, from a, something I have in my office, how does your body feel when you're upset? And when kids can't really tell me, it's amazing what they'll draw on a stick figure, how their body feels. And you know, I always thought everybody felt the way I felt when I was upset. But not at all. Kids have very, very different experiences physically for how they feel when they're angry or disappointed or depressed or anxious. Um, and it's worth asking, how does it feel? Um, and we'll do a body scan. Um, lots of times we do a body scan. We put our hands on our head. How is our head feeling? Put our hands on our heart. How, how is your heart beating? How does it feel? How about your hands? Put your hands together. Are they calm or are they shaking? Let's do a deep breath and do a body scan all the way down. How is your body feeling? Um, this is, um, I, what I'm doing now is just sharing a few things with you so you get some idea of the sorts of strategies that we use. And I do have the um, website here where I got this. And because with young kids, you can also invite kids to become captains of their enemy, of their energy ships um, by playing anchors away. Um, and you can say things like, right now you're going to become the captain of your energy ship. Even though your energy is really high and really scattered and all over the place, this will help you calm your body. First, stand tall like the deck of a ship. Be ready to drop your anchor. Close your eyes and take a deep breath in and really feel the breath as it's entering through your nose and exiting out through your mouth. Breathe in and let your tummy fill up like a balloon. Breathe out and let your tummy go flat like a pancake. Now, imagine that you're holding a rope with an anchor on the end. And drop that anchor right behind you, deep, deep, deep into the earth. So as it drops, you're imagining that it's connecting you to the ground below you, securely and safely anchoring your energy right down where you stand. Feel your feet now solidly connecting with the ground below you, and imagine that this anchor is sending it going deeper and deeper down and dropping deep, deep down as far as you can go. See if you can drop your energy deep, deep down like an anchor dropping down into the ocean. And notice how your body feels when your energy is calm and quietly connecting deeply within the earth. And maybe you can imagine your energy calming and feeling connected and centered and balanced. That's just the beginning of that. But you can see when a child has an experience of their emotions and their body being very scattered and very out of control, like a 30-second exercise like this can be really helpful. Um, this is one of my favorites, too. Um, we call this spaghetti body. 
sometimes your body gets too tight, and that happens when you're really mad at someone. And spaghetti body is something you can do to get your body loose, and that makes you feel better. And since you're the boss of your body, you can make the tight go away. Have you ever seen some wet spaghetti noodles? They're wiggly and they're not tight at all. And you can make your body like spaghetti noodles. Okay, so here's the cool part. To get your spaghetti body, first you have to make your body very tight all over. So let's practice. You scrunch your hands very tight. You can even grunt if that helps. And then now, spaghetti your hands very loose. And we do that with all the body parts. We scrunch them very, very tight, and then we loosen them up. And the, uh, the ultimate um, reaction of something like that is to really feel your muscles relax. Because once, relax, because once they've been very, very tight, and then you let them go, there is a feeling of physiological reaction. Um, and the last thing to know is that you have to practice spaghetti body all the time or it won't work. It's just like when you practice baseball or piano or reading, or tying your shoes. You have to practice it all the time to be good at it. You have to practice it even when you're feeling good and happy, right? Because I'm telling you, you're not going to want to practice it when you're not feeling great. You learn it when you're feeling good, and you practice it all the time. So when you need it, you're very good at it. And that way, you'll be an expert spaghetti kid when you get really, really nervous or mad. Um, we also do the turtle. And I can show you the turtle, but it's not an actual live turtle. It's how you do a thing called the turtle. And it's what you do when you're so, so, so upset. You Too much upset or too much mad can get you into trouble, right? The reason to do the turtle is because it helps you feel better, and it can help you stay out of trouble when you feel better, right? Because you're the boss of your body. You can relax your body, and you can feel better. So you stand with your feet a little bit apart, and then you put your bottom all the way down to your heels. You don't sit down, but you squat, and I'm not going to do it for you. But um, I do do this a lot. Um, you squat down, you grab your knees, bring one arm over one knee and the other arm over the other knee, and then you give yourself the biggest hug ever. Ever. That's the turtle. You stay there and you count to five and you hug yourself as hard as you can. And you stop when your body feels calm and safe. It's just like spaghetti body, you have to practice it when you're feeling good. But then when you're very, very, very upset, you can do the turtle and your body will feel better. <coughs> um, both of these come from my office and you can go on um, the plumtree.net and there's a lot of coping skills and activities. The spaghetti body's in there and the turtle's in there and some other ones as well. Okay, I'm going to just run briefly <coughs> through the rest of the circle when we talk about feelings. Um, and the next one is emotions. And that's really, um, you know, how we, um, how we feel, like how we think we feel. So I use um, a lot of these emoticons. You know, the best, um, the best thing for this was the movie Inside Out, um, because it really showed the value of negative emotions, as well as positive emotions, and how emotions work together to make memories, and how important they are for you. Um, but you'd be very surprised if you work with your kids they may have happy, and they may have sad, and they may have mad, um, but they might not have um, they might not have confused or bashful or ashamed or hopeful or envious. That's a great poster you can get online if you've got praise and put that way right, right, right to the table. Yeah. <laughs> to feel embarrassed, disgust, or maybe just to label line. all the yeah, options. I can't remember what the name of this is. That's great, yeah. It's really important, again, you can't manage an emotion if you don't know what it is. We take this for granted. You know, when I was in training as a psychologist, I'm like, okay, 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 label your feelings. We take it for granted because we, most of us lived in homes where we got taught what our emotions were. Um, but it's not something that you can take for granted. Um, if we go then to thoughts, 
thoughts, this is the whole basis for cognitive behavioral <coughs> therapy, which you might have heard of. It's one of the evidence-based um, therapeutic techniques for working with children who have complex trauma and many other sorts of um, difficulties as well. And it's basically the premise is, if you can change your thoughts about a situation, it will affect your feelings about that situation. Just like the example I gave with the, with the thunder. Um, it was only the thought that labeled the physiological reaction that then resulted in the emotion. And so I worked really hard with the kids in my office um, to change thoughts. This actually comes from um, a little boy who, um, who had a lot of difficulty controlling his behavior. And um, he came up with these, uh, sorry that you can't see the whole thing, but he came up with these sayings. Um, these are his, not mine, that um, he could say to himself. And each one of these replaced a very unhelpful thought. Um, like an unhelpful thought might have been, um, he, that kid doesn't like me at all. And when we talked about that, there really wasn't a lot of evidence for that thought, and it really wasn't helpful. So we replaced that with, he is still a good friend. Um, and when somebody bullied him, that really turned out to be kind of an okay friend, um, instead of playing that over and over and over in his mind, he replaced that with, um, people don't always mean what they say. And it's really talking about, rather than catastrophizing um, a situation or generalizing a situation and blowing it up into um, something that it really isn't, or thinking about something in a way that really there isn't any evidence for, um, you replace it with the thought that you believe to be more positive and helpful. Uh, the last one I want to run through quickly before we talk is actions, and that's, you know, how we behave based on our feelings. Um, if you go to the next slide, I actually love this. This uh, quote is by Dr. Stuart Albion, and it says, behind the worst behavior is a concern, and our job as parents is to listen and watch for the child's concern. What is the issue? that's below the uh, behavior that's problematic. Because children who've experienced complex trauma, remember, they don't have the ability to manage themselves and they don't have the coping skills because the trauma has interfered with their ability to develop those self-regulatory skills. Um, this, was, this is another one of these aha moments for me because um, I grew up in a go sit in the corner time out. Um, I parented in that era. And um, one thing that I learned more recently is we've been um, recognizing that rewards and punishments don't help children regulate their emotions. They might stop a behavior in the moment, but they don't, they're not as helpful in learning to regulate emotions. Um, what we usually do is give a reward or a punishment, right? That's a consequence. And we shape, as parents, we learned to shape behavior through manipulating consequences. Um, and that's called an operant strategy. And that works in many, many cases, right? Um, we do things because we like the consequences or because we don't like the consequences. And that's a very important way to manage behavior. However, um, one of the things that I really have to say is that that strategy assumes that the consequences of the action can determine what the child did. And sometimes the child isn't thinking about the consequences, and even if they were thinking about the consequences, that consequence is not what caused the behavior, and it's not what's going to change the behavior. There was something going on in the environment that caused the behavior, and it's going to happen probably um, whether or not the consequences um, follow it. Because behaviors that are not willfully controlled are not easily managed by consequences, right? Behaviors that are not willfully controlled are not easily managed by consequences. If you can't control your behavior and it's not intentional, then it really doesn't matter what comes after that behavior because you're because you're going to probably make the same mistake over and over and over again because it was not shaped by the consequence. 
So we have to ask ourselves, was that behavior on purpose? Was it intentional or was it in response to something that happened in the room? Was it an impulse that could be resisted? And how could a different behavior be encouraged? You know, we can say to our own children, if they are able to regulate themselves, you made a bad choice, right? Because we're assuming that there was a choice there and that they could pause and think about the choice and then move forward. But you know, sometimes we behave in ways where we didn't have any choice because we don't have the control to make that choice, right? And so that's why we want to intervene at the stage of the behavior, not at the stage of the consequence. And I'm not saying you never give negative consequences because that's how life works. There's natural consequences for what we do. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we run amok with letting kids do whatever they want because they can't control themselves because you learn to control yourself, right? But what I'm suggesting is don't always be thinking in terms of the consequence. And don't always be thinking in terms of the choice because sometimes it's not a willful behavior because the child is not able to regulate that behavior. So that's why you have to step in ahead of time. That's what you call, what is it? What kind of discipline? Compassionate, what is it? What? Becky Bailey. Conscious discipline, thank you. It's conscious discipline. Um, and I just threw this in so that I could remind you, remind myself to tell you that um, there's also a- Can you give an example of that? Conscious discipline, you know, for the behavior. You're saying, if it's not willful behavior, then they, if they can't control their be willful be behavior, then the consequence is not gonna matter. So give me an example of you know, every single day you come in this house and I tell you to put your backpack away. Every single day. I don't have to tell you that. Why do I have to tell you that every day? I want you to be able to come in this house and put your backpack away. No phone again this week. Okay, no, that's an, I understand that. Okay, but let's say if you want to train the child to put the backpack away, okay, so you have, okay, teach them to put the backpack away and there are consequences they don't. What is, how is the child, okay, you're saying that it's not a willful behavior, that the child can't, the child cannot put the backpack away. Right, because when he comes in the house, he's so excited by the transition that he can't, it's very okay. hard so for him to would focus. You how would you I would put a house? visual prompt, like a basket by the door, and I would stand there and I would say, before we go in, we have to remember to do something. Please. I mean, what Dr. Bailey is talking about is, again, it's a brain state issue, it's a regulation issue. Now, my, my children, the two children I have are feelingly exposed, significantly feelingly exposed to alcohol, which is the worst poison for a fetus planet. So he goes, he, he lives at a full boil. He lives like if a pot of water, the amount of time it takes to get into a rolling boil, he lives as though the heat's always on, the lid's always on, and he's at a rolling boil. So it doesn't take much for him to go, whoop. Right. And it could be something little, it could be something big. So I can't control whether he's going to do that or not. But what I can do is keep my my brain saying right. not, so I want to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Mm -hmm. Not hard. When I'm exhausted and, you know, it's just like right. the end of the day and I've asked five times. And so an example I can think of is when, um, when uh, because I know that he lives at this full boil, and this has to do with just pain and alcohol and a lot of domestic violence while he was in utero. I mean, his body was just being, he's really addicted to stress chemicals. And how can he get a dose? Resist, re resistance. I don't want to get a, okay, I got it. Um, so he does need to learn to not like go there. But, but if I react to his behavior, then I'm not, I'm not bringing him up. So what she would say is, first the thing a child wants to know is, am I safe? Right. That's the lower brain. Then, am I loved? And then up here, what can I learn? So if they, whatever the reason, if he comes in and he's reacting to something strongly, the expression would be, wow, oh, Christian, I see your face go, and your hands are going like this. Your face is really red. 
you look angry. So I'm really describing physically what I see. And, and then, so, I, so that he can say, oh yeah, and you didn't want to put away your backpack, but you knew that that's what you've been asked to do. Or he forgot, or who knows what it is because he's so distractible. Mm -hmm. So all I can do is just, instead of reacting to the behavior, try to respond to where he is in a brain state. And that's why she does what's called STAR. For me, I have to smile, take a breath, deep breath, and relax. Because I can't, if I'm wanting him to raise his brain to a higher level, but I'm scowling at him because he's not putting the backpack away, I can't bring him up to a level that I'm not at. And that's hard to do. It is. It's the hardest thing on the planet because we always hear in parenting books, well, in a good enough parenting, 50% of the time, for your average kid will give a healthy kid. But for a parent of a trauma kid, like you feel the pressure to get it right every time because you want to make these good connections and you don't want to be You don't have all the time in the world. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really the hardest thing on the planet. I've never, yeah. But does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah. well you just, yeah, that's excellent. <coughs> Thank you for sharing. That. Right. It wasn't really a choice. Yeah. Right, because he was too wound up in his own emotions. Yeah, and that's the thing. If these kids are looked at as they can't, they, they won't versus can't, Instead of saying he's just not listening, just right. say I'm struggling to listen. It's a, it's, because our perception, my, I would say my perception drives my behavior. If I perceive you're angry with me, even though you're not, I treat you differently. If I perceive you are just disobeying me and affront to my authority and whatever, we're, we're going to engage. Rather than if I see that you're struggling. Right. It's a te kids, then it's a teachable moment. Yeah, and some kids when they struggle, they cry or they get up. But some kids when they struggle, they get angry and defensive, and and, and it's really hard to feel so empathetic towards them. But that's what they need. Right, and controlling. Thank you. Any other examples? I just wanted to put this up because um, I think it's Brené Brown who talks about guilt versus shame. And we develop a conscience, really, through guilt. When we look back, and we think about things that we should do and we shouldn't do. Um, and guilt is what you um, feel when um, the intervention is targeted towards your behavior. Shame is when it's targeted towards you as a person. So, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, it's okay to feel bad about how you behaved, but it's not really, it feels a lot worse to feel bad about who you are. So um, we want to make sure it's okay um, to think about um, behavior that wasn't quite right. But we don't want to inflict shame. And shame is saying that um, you as a person are not quite teaching one time and they explained it that guilt is you um, you made a mistake, shame is you are a mistake. So yeah. it's easy to mm -hmm. like if you're trying to correct somebody it's easy to correct your own self and be like, you made a mistake, you're not a mistake. You can see it come on. Yes. It's all in the use way of language. You know, other past generations they say, you're such a bad boy. Right, exactly. And instead of saying what, what you, you did was bad. Yeah. yeah, right. But it's separating the behavior from the child. Right. So there's a little distance between the action and who you are. And I even do the same thing with feelings. I don't say, you're mad. I'll say, aren't you noticing a mad feeling? Because doesn't it feel less powerful if you're noticing a feeling? You aren't a feeling. I'm not mad. I'm just noticing a mad feeling. And feelings come and go. They never last for very long. So I'll say, um, what's coming up there? Are you noticing some disappointment? Not, are you disappointed? Um, because again, it's that we want to get a little bit of a distance from our feelings so they don't feel so powerful to us. Um, I did have a video I wanted to show you because um, there's only one place where I don't advocate for um, a lot of structure and that's in play. 
um, because I think that there's a really um, nice place for unstructured play, particularly now kids really don't have an opportunity for unstructured play. And if you've ever gone into a very, have you ever gone into a very disadvantaged neighborhood and sat in the playground? Raise your hand if you're with me on this. Um, I don't know if you see what I see, but I see parents who are either tuned into their phone or to their friends or to something else, and there's nothing going on except yelling at the kids um, and correcting them and guiding them and um, judging them. And it's um, and I will share these. Um, if you, if you can't copy it down, I'll share some of these links with you because um, it's really nice to engage in play where the child is in charge. And the child directs the play, and you don't um, judge, and you don't teach, and you don't correct, you just elaborate. You comment, and you elaborate. So that the child learns to play. And the ch because children learn about emotions and behavior and how consequences happen and how one thing leads to another and how relationships work, not only through living it, but through playing it. And I think kids really need to do that, but so often they don't know how to elaborate on their play. Um, especially the kids I see in my house. They kind of line up their toys, but they don't really do that much with them. And so it really helps to just, and this um, was a really beautiful example, to sit and say, oh, so you like to do that. I noticed that you're putting the plate on the table. That plate goes on the table. That's a, that, that plate sits right there where you put it. Oh, now you're looking for another, you're looking for another dish. There's gonna be another dish on the table. I wonder what you're going to get now. And you basically are observing and you're commenting and you're elaborating and you're letting the child know that they're having good ideas and that those ideas can lead to another idea and that the play can become increasingly complex and that their ideas are good. Um, and it's just a, um, a, my very first clinical experience um, was with um, disadvantaged mothers with children who were survivors of the um, special care nursery downtown. And we would guide these mothers to spend three minutes a day of uninterrupted, non directed play. And you'd be surprised that they couldn't do it. Right. No phone, no jumping up and looking at your list, no getting the doorbell, no, you know, going to get a drink of water, nothing. <coughs> Undivided attention for a few minutes a day with no corrections, uh, no teaching, just enjoying. It's a, it's a really powerful experience for a child who's never had that before. Very powerful. So I just want to end on this. This is um, Dr. Perry's research. Um, and he says that research examining childhood resilience reveals that strength and healing occurs for children who've had how many secure attachments? One. Just one. Um, so it, that really surprised me. But it only takes one secure attachment in a child's life to make a measurable difference um, from a scientific point of view. Um, and I just think that's a really powerful thing to think about. Um, and when you think about back to the beginning of the presentation, you can see why. Um, because you're literally the architect of their child's brain. Yeah. What are your thoughts about how long that secure attachment is for? for that child's life. I mean, how long does it have to be to make a difference? <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I mean, we're all in the, well, I think that the majority of us who are sitting here, you know, spend time with the children in our care for only a, you know. A short period of time. I, I think back to um, Dr., one of the videos that um, Dr. Anderson has, and I think it might be the one with Katie Couric, um, where he says, you know, think about a person who was in your life who wasn't in your family, but, you know, maybe a coach or a teacher who took an interest in you and how much power that had in your life. And I don't know if you guys, you know, can remember people like that. But for me, even 
you know, tra very transient relationships, but that they were unexpected. You know, they weren't my parents, they weren't my aunts and uncles, but they were just somebody else who said, I think you're really good. I mean, I still remember. Or you were really good at that. I can remember it 50 years later because it was a, someone outside of my home who took an interest in what I did. I think it's very powerful even when it's transient. <clears throat> Forgive my voice, I'm gonna try. Um, one of the things that is being observed, and I wonder if you have a comment on this, is the idea, you talked about what secure attachment, but transient relationships, you know, there's becoming a term for called love bombing, where you see people go somewhere for a short time, orphanage or somewhere, and they play with the kids, and they give, and they give, and they give, and then they go. And then you get the next group who comes, and they give, and they give, and they give, and they go. And what we're finding, in, especially in international adoption, is that that is a really bad thing. And even the American Medical Association, looking at candidates for medical school, are really starting to look at this whole idea of the love bonding experience, and that you know, what that's really teaching children is the idea that you come, you give to me, and then you go, and I'm still here. And I really want to bring that up because I think that this is very much um, a different way of looking at it than what we're used to, especially in the volunteer realm in America. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to raise that. It's a really good thought. One of the things that we, and I, I'm just going to free associate here because I, um, I don't have any wise, um, I don't have a wise reply, but we um, always write a letter to our foster children and our safe haven children when they leave. And even if they're babies, and one copy goes in the social worker's file, and one copy goes with the child, and it's all about um, how much they meant to us and that we wish that they didn't have to leave, and here's our favorite memories of you. Um, because safe families isn't the same, I don't think, as a love bond. No, no. I, I know, and I'm not saying you yeah, are, no, but, I really referring to but, that, but, but we could make it that way, right. almost, the foster care. Yeah, I think that's a bit. No, the secure attachment, you know, that's got to be a secure attachment that if it's not within the family, that relationship goes on. Right, it's an important. It's not an important yes. relationship. Right. It's that, not. You know, you stay, you know, for a little while or camp and leave, and then the next group comes, and then, you know, so that's really what I was referring to. I'm not really suggesting that Safe Families does that. I think your program is fantastic. I was just commenting on the need for that secure attachment. And right. That, it has to be a relationship that is, is, is ongoing or it's not, okay, well, I'm leaving. And it has and to be genuine. Sense, yeah. It has to be a genuine. It has a lot of attachment theory yeah. and that whole attachment bonding. And if you have it, like an infant, and even if you have six months initially where they are attached to an adult and then have some other experiences later, that is always there. And if you have people or they're going to different homes and moving, they're able to attach to another parental figure. I think it, whereas in those, the ages like that, it doesn't seem like, it's like different people coming in and out as opposed to being in a home like with you all for six months or whatever the time period is where they kind of start making those attachments that can be transferred to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, and again, each child is so different, right. Right. and each experience is so sure. different, and there's the timing and what the point in their life they're at, what yeah. they were exposed to prenatally, all those things play into it. So some kids may benefit from that, and some may not. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the difference, too, um, is that, you know, our goal as a family is to develop a relationship with these parents. It doesn't always happen, but when you do, you are, like, and you can mentor and feed into these parents lives too to share what you're doing with the kid and it, it's not going to be maybe perfect it's not going to be done maybe the same but then they may be going back to 
like something that they would have never thought of how to do. So, you know, it's a little bit different than maybe these other kinds of things because we can kind of almost try to continue that. And if you keep a relationship sometimes after the post date ends, that can continue and you can continue to almost like mentor that parent and give them tips and stuff that they probably would have never gotten. Right, good point. It's a relationship. Right. And even if it becomes a fractured relationship, it was a relationship that you put effort into maintaining. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, in, in God's economy, I really believe that nothing is wasted. So whether I've had a child for a week or a month, um, it, it, it is an offering. It, it is an offering. And, and during that time, if I can love and delight, like if love is really honor and delight, I mean, if I can really honor and delight, and light in that child during that time period, and if possible with the, the bio parent, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how God's going to use that. I just, I just can't know. And, um, and that's okay. There's, there's, there's a lot of buying from doing this ministry right. <laughs> that we just can't resolve. Um, but I do believe what, what the Lord says, and love never fails. Love doesn't look fluffy and nice like some people. Thank you. 